Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. We say the word community and we read about it in the media and we think we know what it means. But it's a big word with a lot of pieces and a lot of heart. Today's guest is going to share with you his version of what community is, what it can do, and how he has contributed to the well-being of New Brunswick in his own private way. Hope you enjoy the show. And if you support the show, you can find the link in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. We'd appreciate that. We're an independent production. Take care and enjoy John Cardi. So John Cardi has been um, an executive director of several organizations. He's run in politics. He's been a community builder for quite a while now, and we're really pleased to have him on the show today. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for thinking of me. <laughs> oh. So when we were warming up before we started uh, to get formal with the interview, um, you talked about experiences with Canada World Youth, and it was in the context of how do we get um, New Brunswick to know itself a bit better. So bringing young people from the north down to see St. John mm -hmm. and bringing people from St. John young pe up to the north. And you went, yeah, just like this experience I had with mm -hmm. Canada World Youth. You want to share that story? Uh, Canada World Youth sets up international youth exchange programs between young Canadians and young people from other countries and cultures in an effort to get them involved in community development. Um, I worked in a number of different countries with Canada World Youth. I worked in Indonesia a couple of times. I worked in Somalia. I worked in Malawi. I worked in Jamaica. I worked in Nepal. Uh, Canadians came from all segments of Canadian society, uh, male, female, English, French, rural, urban, lower, middle, higher income. So each group was composed of these various social demos. The same thing with the people from the exchange country. And you would get you know, the, 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 the blue-haired kid from Toronto and the pig farmer's son from Saskatchewan and, and the kid from rural Quebec, and they're all part of your group in order to get this, this, this mosaic of Canadian society. Um, there would be kids who would come in the program in Canada with their mindset. <laughs> uh, we would go through the program in rural Canada and then they would meet their counterparts and they would go through the program in rural, the other country. The kid that came out at the end of the program was completely different than the kid that came in at the beginning. And it's that being in a situation where those values, ideas, ideals that have sustained you, that created you, no longer work when you're in Little Village, Indonesia. So you have to see another way of living. and. You know, having been in social work for years before that, you would work with kids and families. You know, you get the kid two or three hours every week and they go back home to the values that sustain them. And after years and years and years and years, there's no change. Six months in this program, the kids change radically. If I could give a gift of travel to every young person in the country, it would be the opportunity to live in a culture completely different than their own so that they could discard all of those values and see how other people live mm -hmm. and understand that you know, we're all different. We all come from different values, different perspectives. Uh, reality is a very subjective place. Beautiful. The, uh, one of the themes of the show is that the province needs a new narrative. And the root of that is how do we create change? One of the ongoing issues in New Brunswick is nothing ever seems to change, whether it's fighting poverty struggles, whether it's political patterns, um, whether it's people's voting patterns. Do you think your experiences with that would be one of the keys to how New Brunswick could change and make a leap forward? I think it could, but how do you implement that on a province-wide <laughs> province basis? I mean, people change, you change one person at a time. Yeah. You don't change a province at a time. Um, so I'm, I'm totally at a loss to explain how you would go about changing a province. But if there were opportunities for people to step outside the box, um, you know, within the context of the province, then sure, I, I could see potential for change. But people are hesitant to do that. We're socially structured to go in a particular direction, whether that's academically or whether that's uh, employment-wise. Uh, so people have a difficult time stepping outside that that um, that pattern that's set for us. Yeah. One of the many experiences you've had in your life's journey is to run for federal politics. Mm -hmm. How long ago was that now? Was that 2004, 2004 and 2006, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Did you ever want to take those experiences with, uh, with where change would come from and, and do that as a politician? It was done. Um, Canada World Youth yeah. was Jacques Hébert. Yes, Jacques Hébert, yes. friend of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, yeah. they traveled together. That's, that was the genesis of, of, the, of the concept. Okay. Uh, but in terms of me doing it... Um, We're trying to integrate it. You know, typical as a politician, you're asked, uh, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. The deferral of the responsibility from the person to, mm -hmm. you know, politicians fix this for me. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you've come from another background where, no, it's the other way. Uh, I will help you change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had I been elected, perhaps I could have done something like that, but I, I was not elected. So, mm -hmm. so and, and whether that would have been something that I would have been able, able to, to do would be a whole other story, I guess. But that's probably not what people would have elected me yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Because um, people will say they want a difference in their politicians. You presented yourself as a different politician, and it didn't work, so, meaning you didn't win. I didn't win, yeah. 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 So do, do you have any thoughts, following the political theme a little bit, do you have any thoughts? Um, a lot of times incumbent politicians won't talk about voters. Mm -hmm. um, they'll just want the people to vote for them. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be a critical analysis on voter patterns and voter behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have any... Don't get me in trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was challenging. I, I, you know, I, it, was, it was an interesting experience. I, I found running as a, as a federal candidate to be very stimulating, challenging experience for me personally. Mm. I mean, you, you, you meet other candidates across the country and they say, how many debates do you have in Fredericton? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just <laughs> back to back to back to back debate. So, so at the end of debate with the sports culture, you go home and you do your research for the next debate the next day. And, the, and it's on and on. And, and you very quickly, you know, I can't say you become an expert at all of those things, but you have to learn pretty quick. Yeah. What kind of things are, are, are of, of significance for the voters when it comes to those areas? Mm. Um, and so um, I, I learned a lot. I went out knocking on doors and big riding. By the time the election's here, you, you're knocking with your elbow because <laughs> your knuckles hurt so much. Yeah. But people would say, you know, you're the best candidate, but my family always voted liberal. My family always voted because my mother would turn over in her grave if she knew that I voted. And you think, your mother would turn over in her grave if she knew that you weren't voting your heart, right? But people get stuck. People have a difficult time, again, stepping outside of the box or what they think they're familiar with or yeah. doing an analysis of, of, of uh, what other realities, other parties, other, other value systems have to offer. Do you think that's the place where we are... Um, the most stuck, if that's proper English? I think people in general get stuck there. I can't say it's New Brunswick people. I just think it's people in general. People yeah, have a difficult time uh, adapting to something new. Uh, we're, we're, we're not as, as uh, adept at change and evolving as we like to think we are as, as a species. Yeah, fascinating, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. on the other hand, if we look through the techno technology lens, mm -hmm. um, we would say there's been all sorts of change. Mm -hmm. But on the human behavior scale, there's... We're the, stuck. Oh, there's we, get, we get stuck in the same things. And we've been doing it since the beginning of time. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 I look at racism. I look at war. I look at, at you know, those kinds of things. I mean, look at the, the world situation now. We're talking about just bombing the hell out of somebody. Since the beginning of time, yeah. People have been killing one another based on a perception of, of, of difference, whether it's race or culture or religion or something. We've been doing it since then. We're still doing it. But why can't we get beyond that? What's, what's wrong with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or why is that still the dominant theme? Because mm -hmm. in the sprinkle of all of that, there are those that want to just connect, just love each other, just mm -hmm. be kind, just have some grace, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, but they never seem to... Um, rise to power or rise to authority or to create shifts. I mean, once in a while. Or to be the critical mass. Yeah, that stuff. So uh, how do we, one of those bigger questions, like how do we get there? And maybe it starts on a smaller scale, like a smaller place, smaller province, or your one by one mm -hmm. thing. The age of Aquarius was supposed to have happened by now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know where it went. Cue theme music in the background. <laughs> yeah. But, but that political journey that you went on, um, did you think in a time before that that you would ever do that? I did not. Hmm. So it came and found you. It did. 
And in the end, did it still a positive resonance in your bones? Very that, positive, that very positive. I, I, I believe strongly that, that everything that you do has something to teach you. Every person that you meet has something to teach you. Mm -hmm. So you, you do it, you, you live it, you learn it, you, you take from it, and you move on to the next, whatever that may be. Life is for learning. Yeah, related theme. Um, how did you find the media during your experience as a candidate? Was the media fair? Were they proportionate? Um, one of the challenges in mainstream media is they allocate a certain amount of space or time mm -hmm. uh, based on the party you're with, rather than it's an election period and everybody gets equal airtime. Mm -hmm. class Which is true. Which, and so what's, what's great about the, the, the number of debates here in Fredericton mm -hmm. is that you get exposure that you, through the debates that you might not get through through the front page of the paper. The media. Yeah, yeah. in the media, yeah. Because uh, I feel sometimes for independent candidates mm -hmm. um, who are trying to break out of the mold of the party system, mm -hmm. have all kinds of great ideas and values, you are there to represent your constituency mm -hmm. and you can't find them anywhere mm -hmm. in the media. Mm -hmm. So I always have wanted to challenge the media, how come you're not covering them all as equals? And you've lived through that mm -hmm. where you're not being treated as an equal. I, I felt like I was out there as much as any of the other candidates, that I was seen as much as the other candidates. And again, that's, that's, that's the debates. That's, that was the fact that I made a point of getting out there. I mean, the experience was full for me. I, I certainly did not feel that I got left out of the picture. Mm. And now you're older and wiser, right? I hope so. I <laughs> hope so. I try to be. <laughs> so in terms of a life journey, um, running the volunteer organizations. Mm -hmm. um, you want to wander into that a little bit? Because that, that's a fascinating place to work. It often doesn't get the exposure it needs as a professional workplace. Mm -hmm. It's tend to, you know, business tends to want to come first in our social narrative. Mm -hmm. um, uh, government stuff is, dominates in our no social narrative. And then over here, there's this nice, fuzzy, warm, you know, like social voluntary sector kind of. But that sector is actually larger than the other two. Mm -hmm. We just don't quite perceive it that way. And you've been hands-on. How many years were you executive director of an organization or two? Most of my life I've been involved in that sector. So your question is... <laughs> the fatigue kicked in right away. No, 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 no. It's, 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 such, a, it's such a... It's, it's a big topic. Yeah. And, and my, my feeling about it is that it's there and it's big because it's, it's people's needs, people's values that are being addressed in those organizations. It's, it's, it, it's down to the personal rather than the business. It's, and it's, it's, it's hunger, it's housing, it's, it's, it's mental health. It's, it's, they're, they're issues that affect everybody. Go to every house on your street. Somebody will have an issue that really, aging, you know? All of those things, they, they are part and parcel of everybody's life but they're the things that we tend to gloss over in our pursuit of, of what? Of money? Of, <laughs> of success? Of fame? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Of what? Yeah. Great question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any anecdotes from running um, Meals on Wheels or the SPCA or? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of what would you like to ask? Me? Um, fundraising. Wander into that because people in general, we'll see the reports in the news mm -hmm. about, oh, a golf tournament was held or a drive was held or then it raised this much money, thinking that was the measure of the fundraising. And then there's another narrative. It's like, how come volunteer organizations aren't are always saying we don't have enough, mm -hmm. right? Because they can never get enough budget or fundraising to, to be calm and confident that we were good for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but the media won't cover what goes into how to organize all those events, the amount of competition that goes on for all the other fundraising um, events. So you want to wander into what that's like as an executive director that has to manage staff, manage the facility, and programs and services, and fundraise. A big part of it has to do with connecting with those for whom those issues resonate with seniors organizations. We live in a society where we're very compartmentalized and, and not everybody has a whole lot of contact with seniors. So they don't understand the issues that challenge seniors. So it doesn't mean a whole lot to them. So they're not going to support that. When it comes to SPCA and animals, some people, they're indifferent to animals. Some people, their, their animal is their, their life. 
that's where they put their money. So again, it, it depends on individuals and what's meaningful in their life that will determine where they're going to put their money. But then you have to, you know, find a way to reach out to them in, in ways that uh, um, make them feel good, in ways that make them want to support you. Um, so it, it's, it's constantly having to be creative, constantly having to, to um, compete with multiple issues because, again, how many issues are there? Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> it's endless. It's endless. Yeah. Did, did you ever feel, um, did you ever have a wish that community would get its act together that way? Again, community, communities is... is um, a oh, just, I'm thinking of any, so you're fundraising and you're thinking, but I'm competing with all these other organizations. Wouldn't it be nice somehow if that was more focused or organized or... And, and Coordinated. I'm not quite sure how that would be or who would do that. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's where the gap is then. Because again, Dennis, I, 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 community is a wonderful concept, but uh, it's becoming more and more fragmented, more and more divergent. Um, if you go live in rural Indonesia or rural communities there, people are of the same religion, people are related people are familiar with one another people have a much stronger sense of community they have similar values they have all of those things come to this brave new world of ours mm -hmm. the person who lives across the street is different than the person who lives next door is different than the person who lives on that side we're very divergent in terms of what our core values are and so as a result of that people are you know they're all over the place in terms of of um what's important and there's there isn't that coherent sense of community that is more characteristic of traditional societies uh, it's it's our challenge and as 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 uh, as western society um, and i i it's a challenge that frightens me because i don't see us pulling it together we don't have a religion or spiritual values that we can rally around. We don't have similar social values that we can rally around. What we rally around is Game of Thrones on TV or various things that are so external to, to, to what's really important in the lives of people that we, we fantasize about other people's lives and try to make that our own. And, and so it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't look good to, for me for the future. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. and, but it isn't necessarily pessimistic either. Oh. It's it's part of your life's journey has led you to those awarenesses. Led me, but what about everybody else, right? I mean, people have to find their way through that, yeah. and that's not an easy thing to do. I mean, I, I'm I'm fortunate. I grew up. That, that African concept of it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. Um, what, as I grew up, we had aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents. We were surrounded by. And, and so I had the benefit of, of being nurtured and supported and loved by a whole community of people who were me, who were mine, who knew me, who knew little Johnny, and Johnny's coming up through the field, you know. But, and now, uh, because of the, the, the uh, economics, I guess, people are no longer in their little communities. We travel to the next town, we travel across the country, we travel to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that sense of coherent community is no longer there. I mean, I, I, I feel sad for, for single parent families and the kids that grew up in those. How, how, where do they get the values that they need in order to be uh, the kind of people that we want them to become? Yep. You know? yep. Powerful sense of loss that way. Mm -hmm. um, Big, yep, yep, yep. Yep, there's something to be said for traditional societies. <laughs> Much to be said. They kept yeah. the world going for a really long time. And that's the voice of an elder speaking um, because of that awareness of those pieces. And mm. one of the narratives is that there needs to be an evolving role for elders in society to share those stories yes. so that it's not lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, did you have great storytellers in your family? Um, when you describe being young Johnny and mm -hmm. all around you as... It's usually somewhere in that mix. There's one or two people who are like the family storytellers. That would that would be my mother's father, my 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 uh, maternal grandfather. Um, as I was a kid growing up, he if I could put somebody at the pinnacle of the person that I had the most respect for, it would have been him. He was just this all-round loving, giving, caring, 
stories to tell, skills to show kind of a man. Um, and, you know, for the, ex the duration of his life, I, I could do nothing but look up to him. Uh, wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah. That's nice to have that connection too. That almost, um, in dancing in the gap between what's changed and what was, and then that connection, that powerful connection you obviously feel, yeah, somewhere in there the role of men has changed. As the role of women has changed the past 40, 50 years, so has the role of men. Mm -hmm. So having a male role models in society to create that stability and guidance, um, have, have, do you have any thoughts about that, how it's changed, or what we can recover for men's souls and then how that rolls back to young men's souls and how that rolls into community? My grandfather always said, she's the reason I'm strong, pointing to his <laughs> wife. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what I discovered living in other cultures, other countries, yeah. is that it's women that make the world go round. Yeah. It's women who, who look after the children, who do the training, who do the the loving, the caring, the cohesion in families, but somehow we don't recognize the incredible uh, power, the, 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 the immensity of, the, of the, 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 the role that they play in society. Um, men still continue to, I guess, see themselves as, as head of the families in some ways, and women less so. Uh, yeah, can feel it. Don't yeah. need to say it. Can just feel it. Yeah. The um, because I'm kind of edging into notions of the divine feminine and the sacred male, mm -hmm. and um, it's like bits of both have been lost. Mm -hmm. and do you have thoughts about that? Uh, have you watched it and seen it unfold and change? I I think it's important for young guys to have male role models, to teach them how to use the strengths that are inherent in in boys in males in 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 masculinity and and whether that's um how how to be loving has to be one of those yeah, how, how to be nurturing and supportive and and taking responsibility and doing what you say you're going to do and being consistent and staying there and not running away when things get rough uh, <laughs> you know all of those kinds of things and 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 uh you know women get left behind to do all of those things um i think i think women the loving that they give you know from from the day that they give birth to a child and nurture it through the various stages of its life um, is is the essence of what keeps males together, keeps females together, keeps all of us together. It's it's in there and a basic part of our functioning. You know, again, you think of kids who don't have that kind of loving in the beginning, and you know, they're they're unmoored, totally unmoored. Yeah. And and you have to give women credit for for giving kids the the, the basics in order to try and make it through. Great. I'm, I'm wandering into like a thousand. Uh, places where that might go because of a uh, so would it be as simple as the basic relationship between two parents and a child as a way of recovering community because that's what we started with mm -hmm. talking about community mm -hmm. and you it's so fragmented and then we've whittled it down to the fundamental which used to be the core family unit but that language is, is doesn't even exist anymore mm -hmm. it doesn't, yeah. it it's phenomenal that way. So have we lost something in, in that how women's roles have evolved and women are now professional business people? Uh, have they lost something too? You, you, you can't take anything away from women for wanting to step outside of that, that family unit, circle, house, to do things. You know, w w w women are perfectly capable and should be supported to do those kinds of things as well. Uh, I, I think because we live in an age where we are so transient, it's hard to deny people the opportunity to look elsewhere, to go elsewhere, yeah. to get their financial resources needs met. Um, you know, we encourage people to, you know, the, the world, you know, you can go wherever you want, do whatever you want. Yeah. But I think there's a price to pay for that. Um, because it takes away from that focusing inward and we're more focused out. 
uh, and over there, and and this can't help but if if the family unit begins to fall apart, how can the the the, the, the society not suffer, not not uh, begin to pay a price for that as well? Uh, but that's the way that things are going. Uh, I guess we just have to make the best of that and and uh, not see it as a always a negative thing, but look for the positives. And, and again, it, it probably requires more effort with respect to, to uh, family and making sure that those within the unit are supported as much as they possibly can be, um, so that they have the, the strength and the self-confidence to step forward, but to be loving and caring and yeah. <laughs> appreciative of, of uh, what they're leaving behind, or the, the impact that they can have, the effect that they can have. Yeah. It's almost as if um, the path to our community soul is through the family's nurturing and stability. Always has been. Always has been, I think. And maybe we're not aware of that as much as we used to be, which then reinforces why it's so important that you share that mm -hmm. with us and with an audience so that that surfaces more in the present-day narrative. We, Wouldn't it be we interesting? recently had um, my mother's 90th birthday party. Oh, very cool. <laughs> and it was so wonderful to see all the family come from across the country and uh, you watch the, you know, the nieces and the nephews and the grandchildren and everybody, you know, we all be in a room and sitting on top of one another and arms around one another and just loving one another. And you think, this is our family. <laughs> and, it's, and it was such a wonderful feeling to have everybody together and know this, this, is, this is our this is our unit. This is our projection into the world. It was really quite wonderful. I, I, uh, I feel sad for families who don't like one another, can't stand one another, don't speak with one another, because they lose so much uh, by not staying in touch with the people with whom they grew, evolved, shared values as they got older. You have to you have to accept that people have differences and let go and, and learn how to love you know, unconditional is not always easy, <laughs> but but um, yeah, you have to learn how to love and, and, and find people to love and who, who better to start with than your family. Yeah, yep. Um, different tack, uh, although it is connected, is food of all things, because family and food. So social gatherings, especially family social gatherings, mm -hmm. always center around food. Mm -hmm. um, in in your world, um, has food had a large role to play? And do you have thoughts about um, whether it's the family meal and the history of family meals or great meals, or what it's like now um, trying to secure local food uh, and food security and f food supply shifts in where food comes from, climate change and the impact on food. You know, that's pretty broad. There you go. <laughs> I'm giving you a big palette here to, to play with. Um, but because food is integral to our soul. And, and it was. So I'm trying to go. To and, in, in, and in, you know, farm families, traditional families, people grew their own food. So they had an intimate connection with the food. Um, now we don't. We buy it from the supermarket. But it's still important for people to get together. And as you say, people do get together around food and meals. And, and you know, food managed to maintain its role there. Um, I, I, I think it will continue to be a way for people to get together and connect. I mean, people get together to drink or they get together to eat. There don't seem to be a lot of other ways that we've found in order to do things. I mean, again, you know, or religion becomes, you know, is one of those other things. And people get together to, to, uh, to worship, uh, to recognize their, their belief in, in deity. Um, you know, that's one other thing, but there, there or concert, you know, music, there's, there's, there's a few things that we have, yeah. uh, you know, food being one of them. Um, I, I think the whole idea of local food versus imported food is a whole other issue. I mean, it has to do with environment. It has to do with, with um, sustainability. It has to do with, with, uh, with need and want and desire and, and and what's good enough or not good enough, and how much money do you have to get it anyway? Yeah. You know. So when you ran Meals and Wheels, mm -hmm. sourcing food, was that part of the exercise? No, it was not. It okay. was not. No, our meals were made for us. You know, our our focus was 
Just feeding the seniors. It wasn't again. excess in the food. Yeah. Okay. So as we get older, our relationship with food changes because mm -hmm. we eat differently as we go along. Do you have any stories about the, some of the changes you've made about um, eating patterns or recognizing uh, your health's sake and how important the food is that you take into your body? I read labels. Um, <laughs> and if the list of ingredients there start being more things than I can pronounce or know what they are, I don't, I don't buy it. I, I prefer to eat healthy, um, you know, meat, potatoes, vegetables, um, and I steer clear of a lot of the products that I see on the shelves. Um, and inevitably, I read labels because it scares the life out of me. I look, I look at the different cancers and the struggles that people have with their health and I can't help but think that all of those things on that label are excreted or do they hang around in the body and do they combine and and you know are, are we poisoning ourselves out of existence uh, food a lot of the stuff out there scares me scares me I look at people's grocery carts when I'm in the supermarket and I think oh my goodness you know <laughs> that stuff you're eating <laughs> you don't go over and lecture them, do you? No, I, I, I <laughs> resist doing that. Um, people have to learn at their own at their own pace, at their own level. Yeah. But it's it's people are so easily seduced by labels, by pretty, by concepts, by by you know, with not necessarily thinking their way through what they're putting into themselves or or uh, you know what they're eating. Uh, each takes their own path. So I wouldn't say that I was uh, dogmatic or angelic or any of those <laughs> kinds of things when it comes to food, but I am conscious about, about, uh, about food. So, so for you, you've more or less eaten the same all the way through from being 18 and putting in 4,000 calories a day to being in 60s and changing your more or less been the same for you? Yeah, pretty much the same. Yeah. Some people have moments where, oh, I got to stop eating this way and start eating that way, or... No, 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 no. I, I, I found it interesting, again, living in other countries and other cultures. You know, in Indonesia, I lived in a little fishing village, so it was, you know, mostly seafood and rice. And when I was in Nepal, every meal was dal bat takari. Dal is uh, lentils, bat is rice, takari is a curried vegetable dish. So you'd have that two or three times a day, every day. And it made me realize how fortunate we are to have the variety that we have here. Uh, because in some places in the world, they don't have many places. They don't have the choices that we have. You know, I, I, I could go to the superstore and, you know, <laughs> the apples are more traveled than most people. Yeah. You know, they've come from further. Um, so, so we, uh, you know, we're spoiled. We're spoiled rotten. Yes. Spoiled rotten. And in the process, we continue to contaminate the world because it's, you know, pesticides and, you know, un unhealthy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Jet fuel. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we explore your experiences with your world travels? Like, sure. that, was, that was a nice little glimmer into a Nepal experience. Can, can you share, because I'm thinking here's a young man from Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. Mm -hmm who's now landed here and here and mm -hmm. here. And at some point you decided to come back and stay here. Mm -hmm. um, can you share with us those transitory moments and travel moments? Powerful ones, scary ones? When, when I was a kid, I used to fantasize that I would get kidnapped. And the kidnappers would take me away to, to some faraway exotic place and then for some reason or other, they let me go. You know, my parents didn't have the money or whatever, but you know, they they just dropped. So I had to make my way home. And I realized as I got older, that was a travel fantasy. <laughs> I, I couldn't figure out how I was going to get there any other way. Uh, but Indonesia was was high on my list of places that I always wanted to go because of the flora and the fauna. You know, the animals, the birds, the the whatever, the exoticness of it. So my first trip with Canada World Youth. Would I like to go to Indonesia? Well, would I? <laughs> and it was amazing because. We lived in a little village uh, in the in the north off Sumatra in the Rio Archipelago. So from busy Jakarta up into Sumatra, and you take a boat to this island, and a boat to that island, and then find you know, another boat to the island that we had to get to. 
the island that I lived on didn't even have so much as a bicycle on it. And it was, it was, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It was the most, How old were you? Uh, I would have been, I would have been my early 30s probably. You know, I, I was the group leader, so yeah. I was in charge of the program. And it was, it was an absolute wonderful experience for me because uh, completely different culture, um, completely different environment. Um, interesting lesson, you know, there were Chinese that lived in one end of the village and Indonesians that lived at the other. And when I spent time with the Indonesian guys, the Chinese guys would say, oh, you know, they're not good, they wear skirts. When I spent time with the Chinese guys, the Indonesians would say, oh, they eat pork. You know? So you'd think, man, <laughs> wherever you go, <laughs> wherever you go, there seems to be this, this racism, this difference, perception of difference in culture. Um, and, and so, you know, even this idyllic little village, it was, it was that way. Indonesia was wonderful. Somalia was, I'm glad I went there when I did because Somalia got kind of crazy after, you know, the years that I was there, but um, tough, arid land. You can see why Somalis have to be, you know, have to be tough. Uh, there's two rivers that flow from north to south, the Juba and the Shabali, and in the dry season they dry up. And you look at the countryside and you think there's no vegetation, but you see the goats and the camels nibbling on something while well, there's these, you know, gray, green, thorny things, but it's a dry, arid country. And in the dry season, people walk for miles in order to get a drink from somewhere. You know, we always had to carry our water around with us. And you realize how, how much of a challenge life is for some people. Um, Somalia, Malawi, I was just there in Malawi, but I ate my first bugs in Malawi. That was wonderful. It was ju juicy little caterpillars. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamaica was interesting for me. My, my paternal grandfather came from the Caribbean, came from Anguilla. I'll back up a little bit. When I was younger, um, the Roots thing was on TV. And, and I was working in Toronto at the time, and I was totally fascinated by this Roots concept. And so I took a leave of absence, and I went to the island that my grandfather came from because I had heard that he had a sister there. So I went looking for my grandfather's sister and I found her. Her name was uh, Zeta and Aunt Zeta took me in and you know, called me Little Johnny and I stayed with her for two or three months and I fished for a living with the local fishermen and I looked after the goats and I looked after the chickens. But what really intrigued me was Aunt Zeta. In Aunt Zeta, I saw gestures that I saw in my grandfather, that I saw in my father, that I saw in me, and there was no doubt in my mind that we were connected. And nature, nurture, who knows? But it, it was it was a fascinating experience for me. Um, so again, being in you know, Canada World Youth, jump ahead again. There was being within a cultural environment that was that was um, somewhat familiar to me, uh, for those kind of reasons that I that I mentioned. Uh, Nepal was interesting. Um, Nepal, Nepal was tough. The first year that I was there, the whole team was sick. We had amoebic dysentery, you know. We, we came back walking skeletons with, with you know, with, with clothes on. Um, the second year was much better. Um, and we lived in a little house on the border with India, and you'd see, you know, the, the oxen and the Krishna and the, the bells and the puja and the worship and and the whole concept of, of uh, namaste, you know, and, and you learn, I learned a whole different concept of spirituality in Nepal. And that was one of the other things, as you, as you go through these different cultures and learn about different religions and different approaches to spirituality, it helps you to put those pieces together in your own mind as well. And so, you know, Asia was particularly uh, influential for me with respect to my my spiritual beliefs. Um, I, am I on topic? Or am I? <laughs> no, this this is wonderful uh, because the impact of travel, but also your openness to the experiences. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can travel and not really leave; they bring yeah. with them everything. And you you took big bites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was my job. Um, I, I, when you're with this group of young Canadians or young people from the other country, yeah. it's your role as the group leader, group facilitator to help them to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one of, 
you know, one of the philosophies of Canada World Youth was something that I think I mentioned earlier, was that everything has something to teach you. So if you've got counterparts that are knocking heads, not getting along, okay, you might not like your counterpart, but you know, what, what have you learned about working with other people? You might not like your family, but you know, what, what, have, what have you learned about working in this culture? You might not like the food, but what, what are you learning? And so it's to keep taking it back to, okay, let your emotions go. What have you learned about yourself, about other people, about the world around you? What have you learned? And that's a philosophy that I've, that I've taken in to how I go through life. It's, okay, what am I learning here? What have I learned? And, and you know, you, if I've, I have found in my experience, if I continue to do that, I continue to grow. I continue to learn. I continue to evolve, if I can use that big word. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> yeah. great. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to come home? Um, was in the beginning, it was... Bone rattling? Like was in the beginning. Jarring? In the beginning. That, like the first trip it was. I mean, the first year we you know, in Indonesia. Oh, sorry. I mean, when you were done all of this, that phase of your life, and then you're back in Frederick. Uh, when I ca well, when I came back, I started working with uh, Canadian International Development Agency, with CETA, mm -hmm. and developing programs for, you know, rural Nepal, you know, w my first year with CETA. And it, again, it was based on my experience, so it was a way of taking that experience uh, and, and applying it to what I was doing in my renewed, my new life back in Canada again. And so I was in Ottawa for a while, but then it came time to come back to Fredericton. And was there something that brought you back here? Yeah, my, my parents were aging, and I felt like I needed to be here. Okay. Yep. Um, was it a... Uh, it, because it's home, so I wanted to say, is it a bit of a culture shock? Because with world travels and the bigger perspective and everything is something to teach you, you would come and apply that at home. But one of New Brunswick's... Um, shadow narratives is uh, uh are we welcoming or are we not welcoming you know there's there's a paradox in some of that conversation around the province of so welcome welcoming syrian refugees of late um allowing for diversity in the province um there's sometimes you'll hear all the good stuff and sometimes you quietly hear all the frustrations or where it blocks and that kind of makes sense so you, but I, but I'm, I'm from here, so that was not an issue for me. Okay. Coming back was was part of my evolutionary process and where I needed to be. Um, yes, I had the privilege of seeing all of those things. Uh, I learned. I took. I, uh, I Were you able internalized. To apply, it, apply it here. I, I do on a regular basis. That's what you do. You, you <laughs> take it all. You move it forward. Um, <laughs> I, I. Uh, you, you begin to l realize over time that um, you're hung. I, I was hungry mm. as, as a young fella. Okay. I, I wanted to know this, I wanted to know that, I wanted to know. And I, I got out there and I learned and I took it in and I learned how to apply it. And after a while you realize it's not out there, it's in here. This is, this is where your travels yeah. or be, uh, start to <laughs> become yeah. more important. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how, how you do what you do with what you know. Why I poked at that a little bit is there's been several guests with having the opportunity of a long form interview mm -hmm. who've said their own version of almost the same theme. Mm -hmm. But I went away and I came back mm -hmm. because I realized back here is where I get to really do my work and take all those lessons from away mm -hmm. and bring them in and integrate them here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we don't have that as part of our larger social narrative, and yet there it is. It just needed to surface a bit more. That's part of the aging process. That's the, <laughs> that's part of each person's evolutionary process. I mean, at at some point in time, you have to hand the torch over to somebody else. <laughs> you can't keep doing the same thing. I mean, and and everything in due time. Everybody does what they need to do in their in their in their time. Yeah. Um, can we wander a little bit into? Uh, hmm. The spiritual development, the soul development, um, you've had uh, just your wiring mm -hmm. and maybe your family roots, but be open and take big bites and integrate and learn. And then all the travels. Um, but that soul's journey or the spiritual path is we need to hear the stories of those people who've traveled it so that the younger ones will go, oh, that's how we do it. We sort of know what we want to do to deepen and open and loving but we sometimes don't know how. Mm -hmm. 
Is that enough of a lead to kind of go play with? Well, how, how did you get there? How did you do it? Does that make People are hungry to have an answer to the, to the great unknown. Since the beginning of time, people have been wondering what's behind all this, what, 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 is, what is God, what is spirituality, what is the source of all things. Uh, nobody has a confirmed exact answer for it, and it comes in the guise of different religions, whether that be Islam, whether that be Christianity, whether that be Buddhism, whether that be Jainism, you know, based on their cultural uh, perceptions of things, people uh, define their religion by what they know. Um, I, I don't think we will ever have the answer to that, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that fires people and keeps us always searching, always, always trying to, to figure it out. Um, what, what's, what I found helpful, I'm, I'm you know, appreciative of, was having lived within different cultures with people who lived by different religions. Um, bottom line is, we're all the same. Bottom line is, um, most religions believe in the same basic things. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have been able to survive as a, as a species. Um, it's the peripheral things that end up conflicting um, in, in within different cultures or within different parts of the world. Um, I've had the opportunity to wake up in the morning in, in rural Nepal and, and there'd be a woman outside with puja powder, prayer powder on the tree and she's, she's worshipping deity in the tree, meaning she sees the tree as a manifestation of God. They see everything as a manifestation of God. That's, that's pretty profound. And I, I, I began to think, okay, I guess everything is. <laughs> Everything is. I, I, I buy that. I accept that. Um, but I've also looked at spirituality from a more esoteric perspective. And, you know, there's the whole concept of reincarnation, if, if people want to go that way. And the belief that you keep coming back until you learn the lessons of this world. And then, you know, maybe you don't have to come back in human form anymore. And you continue to evolve until you get back to the source, which can take many lifetimes, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good one too. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so you, you, you begin to kind of try and put all those things together and, and again, live your life right, do the right thing, that whole Buddhist concept, right thought, right action, right vocation, right intent. Eventually, maybe you'll get to it. Is that, uh, obviously it brings you joy? It does. It does. I, I, I love life. I, I, I can stand under a tree and be reduced to tears sometimes, you know, because it's, life is a wonderful experience. Right yeah. um, any thoughts to close this out? This, uh, this has been wonderful. Thanks. Um, and who knows where we were going to go when we started, but that's the fun of this exercise. Um, as we've had this now, is there something, that, oh, we should talk about this. Do you have anything like that that you want to touch on for us? Hopes for the future, directions, things we can pass on to the next generation, that uh, little signposts, you know, in, when, when you're at a crossroads and you're thinking this or that, try to choose this way instead of that way, as an example. You, you talked about at one point where um, the organizations that I work for were often volunteer-based and they are. And I think it's really important for people to make an effort to connect with people other than their immediate environment. Because if you, if you, if you stop reaching out to other people, um, you lose touch with humanity in many ways. And I, I think that volunteering is a good thing. I think it, it's, it's one way for people to continue to maintain their connection with others, um, other, other people's experiences, other people's needs, other people's challenges. Um, you, you have to keep reaching out. 
you have to keep reaching out. I mean, it's it's there's you know something romantic about you know the fool on the hill, you know, and the Beatles song, but but. Uh, it's going to take a while for most of us to get there. Meanwhile, in order to get yourself there, you've got to learn. Continue to learn, continue to experience, explore, enjoy, connect, and grow. Do you have any thoughts on getting older? I'm enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. I, it, it, I, I have a hard time believing that I'm 60, I'll be 68 on my next birthday. Um, because when I was younger, that seemed ancient. It doesn't <laughs> seem so ancient anymore. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thankful that I'm, I'm healthy. I'm thankful that um, I, 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 I see other people who are my age or younger who are awfully old. Um, but for me, it's been a wonderful experience because I, I feel like every day is 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 new and enlightening and and I don't I don't feel like I'm getting older. I think I'm getting, getting smarter <laughs> about some things. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all have our our our, our things that, that that you know can't quite get rid of that keep snapping at us. But but uh you know, you just keep working on that stuff and and understand that everybody has their trials and their tribulations and their challenges and and uh you know, we all come from basically the same cloth, and and we all have different experiences that make us somewhat different. But really, when it right comes down to it, we're all the same, all the same. Yeah. Life is life is a great experience. I've, I've been enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. It's great. Be good. Have fun and love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.